This class is about the chapter in Gonzales called Gender and Sexuality. Uh, but I want to highlight the contributions of feminist anthropology to our understandings of gender and sexuality. I think I told you back a long time ago, maybe chapter one, to not be afraid of feminists. Don't be afraid of feminist anthropology. Did some great things for us. This is where we'll find out what they did. The other thing I like about this chapter, or I like that we're reading this chapter at the end of this unit, is because it takes us back to where we began the unit with chapter seven, previous chapter, but we read that at the right after our first essay. So this unit is framed by these two chapters, actually. And in part, it's because uh, anthropology, if you remember, but that was a long time ago, anthropologists were very interested in those studies of kinship and relatedness. You remember that person doing the kinship charts, and we had the circles and the triangles, and we talked about how those assumptions from Lewis Henry Morgan, that there was this ascending line of, of kinship as well as marriage and that everybody had to do things in a certain way. And we talked about how there was an assumption in some of these late 19th century studies of what we would now call heteronormativity. All the kinship charts were supposed to be either triangles or circles, and triangles and circles were supposed to marry each other and have two children, and that should be the way it is. And so there was this assumption that that was the, the norm and that we were going to go out and find that in other societies. And if we didn't find that, then that would be an indication that they weren't up to what we wanted them to be. They weren't as civilized as us. Now, in the last uh, class and in this chapter, we read about Margaret Mead uh, and her work, Sex and Temperament, as well as uh, other things. Uh, and Margaret Mead and, and Ruth Benedict, uh, obviously they were also kind of intruding into, the, into a, a very male-dominated space of academia. And we talked about this also as well, even in anthropological circles, there was a tendency to prioritize those dashing young males going out there to collect data. So what does Margaret Mead do for us, Juliana? What's her deal? Okay, so she is one of the first to kind of talk about how when you go to different societies, even downriver from each other, as we talked about, in the last class, people could be very different and have very different expectations about how people should and shouldn't behave, and this could extend to uh, different kinds of gender roles. And so what uh, anthropologists found was that there was a, what I call a dizzying variety, a whole bunch of stuff going on in terms of kinship organizations, marriage relationships, families, all those things that we uh, that we associate, or I mean that, that, that we think of as set in stone or set by biology or set by heteronormativity were actually done in all kinds of different ways around the world. And I guess I would say, uh, this may sound, I'm putting a few things in quotes because I don't want to make anything that anybody's doing I'm not applying the, the term weird to whatever we're doing, but the things that some people are like, whoa, what are you doing that for today? And people get all freaked out about, there's probably something that we can find anthropologically speaking, and we saw some of that in this chapter, that is even stranger, either historically that we've done in our own society or cross-culturally, when we look out and we're like, whoa. What we do is like hardly uh, hardly weird at all. So whatever is people are getting freaked out about today, we can probably look back or look across and see something that is that is even stranger going on. And actually, let's see, Evan, what were the anthropologists or the ethnographers one of the first to kind of think about this in terms of our personal feelings about that?
Yeah. Yeah. So we have, you know, people like Margaret Mead and Benedict doing these things who are condemned by their society and feeling like, am I, am I inadequate? And I, am I, am I doing the doing things that are wrong and feeling this kind of distress? And as Gonzalez put it, uh, anthropologists were really one of some of the first people to say, no, it's not necessarily uh, in kind of something innately wrong with people. The expectations in your environment may not correspond with what people are doing. And in the 1970s, especially, that's where the, the kind of the, the wave of, of the more explicitly feminist anthropologists came in and said, wait a second. Look at back at all those funny things that people were doing with kinship and marriage and family. And it's not just a curiosity. It's not just something that we uh, that, that we study to say, oh, look at the so-and-so over there. But they were actually interested in how these things were linked to ideas about power and social relationships and how they might tell us different ways in which society could be organized or different possibilities. What were the limits and the possibilities on human organization? How could we learn uh, from other societies and how could we uh, how could we change things in today's world? So the, the feminist reinterpretation of the anthropological data was hugely important. It perhaps began with people like Mead and Benedict, but they were in some ways also imprisoned by the circumstances of their time. So from the 1970s comes, although you could probably see it in, in Margaret Mead's work, but in the, this term, the differentiation between sex and gender really comes to the fore out of that uh, feminist movement where people began to affix two different meanings to these terms. Taylor, what do we, What's the difference? What should we think about when we turn th think about sex, and what should we think about when we think about gender? Gender is the set like um, of social means defined by culture. So it's for gender, meaning it can be like interpreted to like the person's own like internal like feelings. Okay, so we have the biological difference, very well described, the sex differences, hormones, reproductive organs, all genetics, chromosomes, all that stuff, it's as different from the social meanings and expectations. So uh, Taylor, you did a good job describing the sort of the individual feelings and those kinds of things. What else happens there, Felicia, in terms of gender roles? What are we? What have? What are? What are gender roles coming in here? Um, gender roles in society are referring to like how we're expected to act, speak, dress, and be on the last assigned to sex. Okay, so part of this is like I mean, we when we talk about gender, part of it is we often think about how we are feeling and how we are feeling in relationship to our gender identity. But in terms of how we're thinking about studying this, we have to pay a lot of attention to the expectations and the role expectations that we place upon people when we believe that they have a certain biological uh, biological difference. I was just reading about one of these very depressing things because uh, it was talking about how student evaluations of, of female professors tend to go down as the women get older. And they go down, and especially the worst was at age 47. And I was wondering this because my wife is a professor and like it's been hard because even though she's gotten more experience, the student evaluations tend to go down for old, for middle-aged female professors. So these expectations, we may not, we may, we may be doing exactly the same thing, but we have these expectations that, oh no, women should be talking like this or talking like that, or women shouldn't be criticizing my paper in the same way. So they get more grade complaints 
more of these things. So just something to keep in mind, our expectations and role, uh, ideas about who should be in what role. Now, one of the problems that has happened though, is that in popular use in the world out there, the term gender is just what people use because they don't want to say sex. Because of course, sex also has that other meaning of having sex. So they're like, oh, wait, when I talk about things like sex, I'm just going to say gender instead. And so a lot of times when people could say or should say sex, they actually say gender. Example, when you have seen maybe those gender reveal parties where a cannon goes off and all sorts of pink ribbons fly out and then it lights the forest on fire and everybody dies. Um, don't do these, but <laughs> also it's interesting, these are never called sex reveal parties, but that's actually what they are. All they're doing is saying, hey, we saw something on an ultrasound and now we're going to reveal the biological sex of our uh, of the of the I don't know what stage we're going to be at maybe about 20 weeks so we're going to reveal it we're going to reveal it but they should be called sex reveal parties probably if people went to those they'd be expecting something quite different so they call it gender reveal but the point is it's hard to, in today's society to uh to use these terms because people have such different expectations and it made me it made me think about like, wow, you know, like, I mean, in some ways, I think we have gotten a little more, some of you said, more, we're more fluid, we're more aware of gender now. But it, it is also the case that in the last 20 or 30 years, we, because we have these ultrasounds and things that we can find out what we think the baby is going to be, like, then we paint the nursery before the kid is even born get all the clothes that we're expecting, all this stuff. In the old days, you had to do it afterward. You know, you figure, oh, wait, that's what I got. I mean, in the very old days, people didn't even know they had twins. Sometimes they'd have twins and they'd be like all surprised. Yeah, it's true. So, you know, but in the new days, in these days, you're looking at that and you're like peering around and you're like, ah, I think I see something. All right, make it blue. Paint that nursery blue. You know, so I think that, I'm not sure. I, I suspect that maybe maybe people would not be so hmm, hung up on gender if we weren't gendering people from like day zero, negative days. But um, yeah, so that's, that's happened. In Gonzalez, she talks about this episode. It was an interesting episode where she talks about giving her daughter the choice between Two different toys, the dolls and the cars. The dolls and the cars. When my daughter, Maya, was very little, I made sure to provide her with all kinds of toys. So, comes in and her daughter's playing with the cars instead of playing with the dolls, and she's all happy about that. <laughs> and I guess I, I wanted to just think about this because I have heard this many times, even from people that should know better. They're like, oh yeah, I gave my kid fire trucks and dolls and look, they went with the fire trucks. So they must, that must mean that there's something innate going on. And I'll just say this, by the time you, you're given your kids toys to choose from, there's already been so many cultural stuff that they've been thinking about. So whatever you're doing with your little toy choice there, don't pat yourself on the back and don't be surprised if they choose something that matches up whatever gender that you were expecting to have happen. Because it's not just you, it's a society, it's everything that's going on and it happens way before people can talk and have all these kinds of things. Now, I'm not saying that everything is cultural. I'm not saying you can make somebody into whatever. No way. There's obviously a lot of biological stuff going on and different people are different all over the place. But just be aware that there's a whole lot of, whole lot of stuff in society that we're doing before people can ever talk to you about which, which toy they're going to play with. We also have to remember 
what do they do with the toys? So in this example, she says that she was playing with the cars and then her daughter says, well, this is the daddy car, this is the mama car, and these are the baby cars. And she was like, ah, oh, darn it. I thought you were going to do boy stuff with the cars and turns out you're doing family stuff. And so what's again here, though, I wonder about, you know, what people are doing with the toys. And in this case, I am sure that Gonzalez's daughter probably heard all kinds of discussions about, all right, who's going to take the kid this time? Who's got the child care? You know, so who knows what, what kind of car stuff she was playing. That has a big a big role in this. So don't be don't be surprised when even three-year-olds and two-year-olds and zero-year-olds come out with all this funny stuff because we've loaded it up on them. All right. So in this chapter, we learn something that is perhaps becoming more apparent to us as we go along. We learn that in many societies, and we also learned this back with Margaret Mead in the Living Theory chapter, there can certainly be more than simply two social genders, our ideas of male and female. One of the best places to know about this is on our own continent where the people, the Native Americans across the continent in many, many different groups uh, had ideas about what were called, uh, I think this term applies to many places, but two-spirit people, people that had been born or acquired uh, different, uh, th that would fit into kind of a third third or fourth gender role. So these were not people who had been necessarily had any sort of biological modification or they were not necessarily biologically intersex, but they would be biologically perhaps one sex, but take on a gender role of another, or they might have their own special role in society. So they'd be asked to be asked to do special initiations or special spiritual things. And in some ways, many of the people who would fit into this category would would do what we would say would be a homosexual activity, but wouldn't necessarily identify as, and we'll talk about this in a second, as a homo, wouldn't take on a homosexual identity, because in part it's hard to, you don't have the same identities when you have three or four or five genders going on, right? You don't have that because what do you do if you're a some one gender who has sex with someone of a third gender? What kind of sex is that? I don't know. It's not doesn't fit our categories. There's another very famous example of an India of the hijras. In this case, oftentimes there are surgical modifications. Um, and so you can read about those. They're, uh, they're another pretty pretty famous example. But we could actually look around the world. There was a film on PBS called Two Spirits and uh, talked about how on every continent and in what they called in hundreds of societies, we see different uh, three plus gender societies plus roles for more than two genders or multiple genders in, in many different societies. So this happens in a lot of places. There are some, again, some famous examples, but uh, this is not, is not at all uncommon. So it leads us to, I think, one of the main points, or I think is one of the main points of the chapter. Pluto, how should we think about binaries? Yeah, I think I, th one of the main points of the chapter for me is should always be careful when we have binaries because our social binaries often cause us to see the world in ways which the world may not actually be. And so I'm going to leave this as a question, sort of consideration question. We have in this society, we've grown up since about the 1950s at least, with a very firm social gender binary. And because of that gender binary, often we want to see different sex, biological sex characteristics or our sexuality fit into similar binaries. Now, 
most people, or I mean many people, are realizing that people's biology is actually a lot messier than we once thought. So we read about on page 165, the condition of being intersex, which is, you know, a, a sort of true intersex individual is rather rare, about every one in every 2,000 people. But there are other conditions like having XXY chromosomes or, or um, sort of an extra chromosome or an X, which are people can live out their lives without actually even knowing that they have some kind of anomaly there. Um, we used to, to uh, and I probably we still do this, we has, used to try at birth to, if someone came, came out with anomalous genitalia, the doctors would just all huddle and then decide and say, well, we're gonna fix them, fix them one way or another and do a surgery. Um, the people who are, who, who are in the intersex community have asked, hey, can you just chill out for a while on the surgical stuff and just let the thing, let, let people go for a while? I mean, there are definitely conditions in which it's, it's perhaps more obvious than others. But um, basically the idea is, hey, we don't know, we, we, should, we should be a little, uh, a little careful to simply assign people to the binary about these things. So there are, I believe, more people both in biology and Psychology, sociology, thinking about sex beyond this kind of binary. Some people have have postulated that sex occurs more on a kind of continuum, that there's a sort of gradual range or a spectrum. And others have said, well, it's not exactly a spectrum as much as it is kind of multiple possibilities. Now, I've put question marks by all of these because I think that uh, in some ways, uh, biologically speaking, there is a there is a lot of binariness to sex. There's a lot of people who fall into either the kind of the male or the female category uh, in, biologically, but there's a lot of people that that are not not as clear or not as or, or overlap with others uh, than than we once uh, believed. So we just have to be careful that our our gender blinders don't make us make us believe that biology is, is as clear cut as we once thought. This also applies uh, to the idea of sexuality. So because of our, in some ways, our gender binary, we also got into a kind of binary about heterosexual and homosexual as an identity and the belief that you were either one or the other and that that was something that was to find you. And so I guess the first thing that I would say about this is that the idea that, that there are people who are heterosexual and people who are homosexual, and that is your identity and that is fixed, is actually a fairly recent idea in human history, this idea that you could identify as heterosexual or homosexual. In all societies, we see heterosexual and homosexual activities, things that we could look from the outside and say, aha, here's some heterosexual activity going on. Obviously that has to happen every so often or society will not survive, but there's also gonna be some homosexual activity going on. But that doesn't mean that people are going to carry that as an identity. So of course there's ancient Greece and ideas about sexuality, which were not linked to necessarily an identity. And then there's a, there's another famous example of the Toro, where the men engage in homosexual activities in order to acquire the strength to then engage in heterosexual activity, which is different, right? <laughs> Probably wouldn't, uh, you know, it's not exactly what we'd expect. And even today, even in our societies, uh, such as if we look across at places like Brazil or Latin America, uh, the idea of what it means to be heterosexual or homosexual actually varies across society. So I don't know, I don't want to do too much graphic stuff here, but in many societies, oh, it's kind of like ancient Greece. It's like the, the penetrated or the penetrated partner. And so you can be 
considered completely heterosexual, but also be having sex with men. But as long as you're not, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, that's what, that's one part. And then also just to, just to be very clear about this, that it, many societies have also had some form of long-term same-sex union. So this is not something that just happened. Uh, 10 years ago, this is something that has happened in, in, in many societies around the world. What they will do with them is, uh, is, is obviously variable and some societies are very condemning of it, but this is not unusual in other societies. So I guess that brings us to, well, is this my main point? I said, be careful of binaries is the main point, but there's another main point. When we think about things like there's this whole thing about body modification in there and sex operations and sex change operations and third genders and gender bending and doing different things in your families and being complex in your sexuality. What I want to say here is we often see these things as happening in the last 10 years and we're like, oh, my God, the bathrooms, what are we going to do about the bathrooms? But actually, this is not something that's recent. It's been going on all over the place for a very long time, and it's not unique to the United States or to, uh, to industrialized countries. This has been going on in many different places. That said, when we get all crazy excited about complexity and difference and how wonderful it is that people can express themselves in different ways, we don't want to overlook the power differentials and the power dynamics there. Francis, what's one way that power, power dynamics come out in gender roles? Yeah, so we have to be careful. Sometimes we get really excited about complexity and gender bending and we start to think about different things I just urge you to always keep in mind that some of these differences can can result in hierarchies or often do and in inequalities and so we have to be uh, we have to always be paying attention to that so anyway